thanks to God for the privilege of being here. Amen. Um, let me pray at this time. Uh, you'll notice when I pray, I, I like to keep my eyes open. And it's not because I'm looking at anyone or at anything. It's just that I, uh, I love what the Bible says. It says, watch and pray. And, uh, and so there's something I'm looking up to. Us. <laughs> so you'll see what I mean yeah. as we go along. So pray with me, please, saints. Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, I thank you and I praise you. You are such a glorious God. Look at what you've done in our lives. Look at how you spared our lives. Yes, you've given Lord. us life and Lord. strength Amen. and breath. Yes. You are so great and you are so awesome and you are so mighty. You are worthy of the praises and the glory. You are great and you are awesome. You are awesome. And in all of this, you should see fit to give us your son and to give us your spirit and to give us hope and to give us life, how great you are, how majestic you are in all of the earth. And so I, along with your saints here, I bow before you. And I acknowledge at this time, I am not here to listen to me. I am here to listen to you. And so open my ears to hear you. And open my heart to receive you. Open my hands to be receptive to the things that you want me to do in the light of your word. Because I know it's not a matter of if you will speak. It is a matter that you will speak. The issue is, will I obey? And so, like Joshua, as for me and this house, we will serve the Lord. We will be obedient for your great name's sake. Amen. 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 It really, you know, it really is a pleasure to see It really is a pleasure to see all of you. Um, eyesight, I, I tend to uh, appreciate now more than ever before. Eyesight is crucial. Eyesight is crucial. And uh, to be able to appreciate how well adorned God has put you together, um, how you're fixed up, you know what I mean? Um, as in not just the clothes, but because you, you are dressed very well, don't get me wrong. It's not just about the clothes, it's about, the, um, it's about what you see in people's faces. So I look at your face and I see life. And it's not your life. It's the life of Christ in you. And that is a privilege. It's a privilege for you to be able to have that in your face, but it's also a privilege for us to be able to see it. Because when I see it, there's only one person who's getting the glory for you. Only one. Only one. Okay, so if there's a word that I want to uh, share this morning, in fact, I was... Um, how I, to give you a bit of an insight in terms of the preparation um, for the word, you, there's no two ways that I prepare the word the same, no two ways are the same. So it's not like a, it's not like I get a template and I say to myself, okay God, this is how you'll speak, this is what you'll do in the beginning, this is what you'll do in the middle, this is what you'll do in the end. I don't have that approach with God because God doesn't have that approach with me. I'm not sure if you've ever, ever had a week that's been exactly the same as the previous week. Uh, I'm not sure if you even had the same day that was the same as the day before. So in the same way that God, God wants you to grow in knowing and, he's, and he is changing you, in the same way my approach to the word is, is fascinating. So Mom, what happened was that when I was um, praying in preparation, um, I had one title, uh, and then three days later I had another title, uh, and, then, uh, and then five days before today I had another title, uh, and then and then two days I had another title. Uh, and then when I woke up this morning. Uh, yeah, another one. <laughs> so let, 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 let me see if I can be um, orderly. If there was one word I would want you to remember, that word would be agenda. Agenda. If there were two words that I'd want you to remember, those two words would be God's agenda. Amen. And if there was a sentence that I'd want you to remember, it's an, an interesting statement that your Lord Jesus said, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Amen. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Amen. Uh, why that fascinates me is that it's Jesus who's saying it. My Savior is saying, Nevertheless, not my will. Jesus, the one that we're celebrating and that we're worshipping and that we're, that, that, that we're, he is saying, nevertheless, not mine, but yours be done. 
Because it's not about my agenda, it's about God's agenda. Mm -hmm. It's not about my will, it's about God's will. Yeah. And what I want us to appreciate this morning more than ever before is that just when you think your agenda is going to happen, Jesus will come in and mess up your agenda. Amen. 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 He's not going to slightly adjust it. He's not going to improve it. He's not going to shape it to make it better, make you feel better about it. He will look at your agenda. He will, he will see how hard you worked on that agenda. How hard you worked on that agenda. He will notice each point in that agenda. And then in his loving kindness and in his mercy, he will say, no. Hallelujah. Not that, but this. Hallelujah. And then your issue will be, will you say, yes, Lord, I will do this? Mm. Or will you complain about that? Mm. 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 So when he does that, mm. will you complain about that? Mm. Or will you say, yes, Lord, this? Mm. 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 Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I, I find a, a big privilege about being here this morning. I love how my pastor and my friend and my brother, if I can call you all three in one sentence, um, I love how he says that it's about continuity. Uh, Mom, I love continuity. Uh, I love how God keeps something going. Um, a few weeks ago, in fact, we were blessed to have the apostle um, here, and he was preaching from one of my favorite um, episodes in scripture. Uh, he was preaching from John 9. And you remember that he started John 9, and then after starting John 9, he promised us five. Yeah. And we only got two. Uh, but we're grateful for the two, yes? Because yeah. we could have had none. So we're grateful for the two that we received. Uh, and so I want us to remember John 9 because we'll be coming back there. And then after the apostle uh, preached a week after him, I was blessed to be able to sit and take note and learn uh, from Mama Jo. Now, Mama Jo, I think she prefers to be known as Auntie Jo. <laughs> it's a preference that she has. And I want to honor her preference. However, uh, I read in scripture, I don't know, I, I was reading a scripture recently, um, Pastor Daniel. Um, I was reading that episode in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, and the episode in Genesis chapter 17 was when God approached Abram. And he told Abram, I'm going to make my covenant with you. You better walk blamelessly before me. Now, I find that very interesting. Why would God tell Abraham to walk blamelessly before him? Uh, and what I discovered was the last thing that we read is in Genesis 16. And in Genesis 16, um, Abraham and Sarai thought that they would help God out. Mm -hmm. uh, because they noticed the, t the time, and the time was like, oh, I'm getting old. I, I'm not really in a position to have babies. I'm supposed to be having babies now. So let's, go, let's help God out. Yeah. And so Sarai said to Abraham, listen, I can't do it, but I know a woman who can. Here's this woman from Egypt. All the places Egypt, eh? Here's this woman from Egypt. Why don't you go in onto her? And then whatever comes out, I'm sure it will work out for us. <laughs> so Abraham and Sarai thought that they could help God out. And did you know there are 13 years between that episode and chapter 17. Yeah. 13 years where there's no record of God and Abraham talking. And the first time that you hear a record of God and Abraham talking, God tells Abraham, you better walk blamelessly. And then in that episode as well, Dad, God tells Abraham, Abraham, I, I know that that's what the name that your dad gave you, but I've got a better name for you. That's right. You are no longer Abraham, you are Abraham. Abraham. Because you are the father of nations. So and not only that, but it's not just and then it's not just that. God says it's not just you, Abraham, or Abraham. It's your wife who was Sarai. She was Sarai. But you, you ever get you ever get a good time with God and God says, That's not what I had in mind. That's not who you are. You are not Sarah, you are Sarah because you are a mother of nations. Hallelujah. You may not feel like it at the moment, but did you know that uh, there is a mother of nations here? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why I will no longer refer to you as Auntie Joe. Your mother Joe. 
Because there are ministries that are going to be Hallelujah. Yes. And, and the good news is, she's not selfish. She's not the only mother here. She's not the only mother here. There are women of God here who have been praying over their sons. And God is here to tell you, it's not just that son that you're going to look forward to seeing God bless you. And in case we're feeling a bit insecure, men, it's not just for the woman as well. It's not just for the woman as well. But it's just to affirm the fact that I was here, because I was all, if all of that was to come back to the point that I'm here because Mama Jo was here and she was preaching so powerfully on the issue of the always at all times. And she wanted us to remember that there were three key instructions that Paul gives to the church in Thessalonica. Those three key instructions are rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances, give thanks because this is the will of God. Because remember, it's not my will, it's his be done. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, because when bad times happen, your will says, let me grumble and complain. Nevertheless, not my will. So yes, this hurts. And as the woman of God said later on, when it hurts, you have to feel it because it hurts. If you lost somebody, it hurts. God isn't saying, don't feel it. In fact, God tells us that we should mourn with those who mourn. We should come alongside them. We should feel what they're going through. I was hoping for this, and it's lost. You're mourning, I'm mourning, we're mourning together. And yet the will of God still says, I should still rejoice. I should still pray. I should still give thanks. So you can already see how the will of God messes up your will. It, it doesn't adjust it. It doesn't. It doesn't make it look prettier. It doesn't put a bow on it. It doesn't. Oh, it says your will is that, but no. <laughs> Though they slay me, yet I will trust it. You can only say that when you say it's not my will, but it's your will. Though the circumstances look brittle, I will still trust you. Amen. Oh, though my friend left me, I will still trust you. Hallelujah. Though I lost the job, I will still trust Hallelujah. you. Though the Hallelujah. bank balance doesn't reflect where I'm coming from, I will still trust you. Hallelujah. You can Hallelujah. only say that when you understand that it's not about your will. Hallelujah. 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 Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you. you can only understand that when you recognize it's not your will. Because you know your will. So let me talk about this word agenda. As I said, one word agenda, two words God's agenda, sentence, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let me talk about the word agenda. Uh, may, I, may I talk about the word agenda then? Yeah. Thank you very much, Father. You see, are you acknowledging the word on your life already that you're a father's nation? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the word agenda, uh, we, have a, we have at least three keen students in this room, and they could tell you better than I could what the word agenda means. But for the, for the sake of the argument, Allow me, please. Is it all right at this time, Daniel, if I explain it rather than you? Is that all right? Thank you. <laughs> In fact, Daniel is even saying, Phew, I'm glad he didn't ask me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, when you have an agenda, what you essentially have is a list of things that you want to accomplish. Yeah. An agenda is usually seen in a meeting, but it's not just about meetings. When you have an agenda, you have a list of things that you want to go through. A list of things that you want to go through. And that list, whatever is on that list, you're saying to the world, this is important to me, and the order of it is important to me as well. That's an agenda. So hopefully you can see that everyone has an agenda. And it's not bad to have an agenda. In fact, it's healthy. Because as I understand it, the only way that you can't have an agenda is if you are dead. As long as you're breathing, you have an agenda. Even that lazy person that you call lazy, that person has an agenda. His agenda is, I will be lazy today. <laughs> and remember, he, he's conditioned himself to do that. 
So he will say to himself, what time will I wake up this morning? They're waking up at 8, I'll wake up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> what time are they going to sleep? They're going to sleep at 10 and 11, I'll go to sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Now, what will I do today? Other people are working hard and earning graft. I will turn on the PlayStation, and then I'll play this game, and then I'll go to the movie and watch that movie, and then I'll have this to eat, and then after I've had that to eat, then I'm going to go back again and play some more World of Warfare, or whatever game that they're playing these days. And I will play that all night long, and then at 3 a.m., I'll say to myself, you know what, it's probably time that I had some sleep. And then I'll get to sleep to wake up at 2 o'clock to do the whole thing again. That person <laughs> has an agenda. <laughs> and you notice it takes effort. Yeah. Oh, 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 let's not kid ourselves. Even lazy people work hard. We criticize them. Oh, how dare you, how dare you do this and that and the other. But they've actually conditioned themselves and they put a lot of effort into doing something that will actually amount to nothing. <laughs> because after all of those years, playing all of those games, going to watch all of those movies, what will they have for it? What will they have for an account for it? They will have nothing. They could tell you about the game that they played, but you will look at them and you will say, you're sad. <laughs> you know more about a game than you know about real life. Mm. So agenda, that is to say we all have agendas. And it's not a bad thing to have an agenda, as we'll discover. It's not a bad thing. But the question is, who's setting the agenda? Who's setting the agenda? Because as we criticize that lazy person, uh, God will have us to understand that we ourselves are no better than the lazy person. But don't take my word for it. Let's go to the Bible. Uh, by the way, when I said we, I mean we as people, as human beings. I don't mean you as super spiritual saints that know the Holy God. I don't mean you. I just meant people as a whole. Yeah, but let's go to the Word of God. And in the Word of God this morning, I want us to go to the book of John. And as we go to the book of John, I want us to fly up to the book, uh, to the chapter John, chapter 5. Uh, no, no, no. In fact, it's worth doing it in order. That's right, though. Let's go over to the um, chapter 20. So, John chapter 20. So, everyone has an agenda. And believe it or not, your agenda, unless it's in line with God's, will go against God. Mm. So unless your agenda is in line with God's agenda, your agenda is going against God. Good. So John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Um, allow me to read John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. That says as follows. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. something and you say to yourself, that was so good, let me read it again. Do you ever get that feeling? Because yeah. I've got that feeling, so let me read it again. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, ah, but these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. John has an agenda. And he's not scared to show you his agenda. He's saying clearly, listen, there are other books that talk about the life of Jesus. There are other books. Yeah. Uh, but I am deliberately writing this in this way so that you can understand what my agenda is because my agenda is simply this i want you the reader to understand i want you to believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and i don't just want you to believe that i want you to know that when you believe that jesus is the christ you can have life in his name amen amen 
Why that is good news is that if you were to tell a stranger, for example, on the street who doesn't know anything about God, if you were to go up to them and say, listen, I want you to have life, they won't turn around to you and say, so what do you think I'm already doing then? I'm, I'm already alive, aren't I? I wake up in the morning, I go to work, I complain that I don't earn enough. I, I, I'm already alive. What do you mean I can have life? I already have life. Oh, but what John wants us to understand is that without Jesus, you don't have life. You can exist. You can go through the motions. You can follow the agenda of other people. Get as much as you can get. Get the house, get the car, get the family, get, 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 get. You can follow the agenda of the world, mm -hmm. but you will not have life. Yeah. Ah, but we remembered. And this is so when you read John's agenda, you can understand why you will find in John Jesus saying, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You can understand that because it's John's agenda. His agenda states clearly that the devil has an agenda. And his agenda is threefold. And I'm always fascinated with the order of the agenda. Because the order is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And you're saying, but if I've already been killed, what is there to destroy? That's a fair enough question, isn't it? If I'm already dead, what is there to destroy? And this is why Jesus' promise of life and life in abundance isn't just a promise about life here, it's about the promise of life for eternity. I read in my scripture that we are all going to be resurrected whether we believe or not. The issue isn't if we'll be resurrected, the issue is what condition will we be when we're resurrected. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. Because Jesus has come so that when we're resurrected, we can be resurrected to be like him. Hallelujah. 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 We can be like him. Yeah. In all of his glory. We can be like him in all of his power. We can be like him with life that does not end. Yeah. It is why in John we read, I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we read it there because John has an agenda. Yeah. Oh, his agenda isn't just that you believe. Oh, you can believe that he's the Christ, but he wants you to know that you can have life yeah. in his name because without him you're not yeah. alive. Without him, you're just existing. Without him, you will be resurrected and it won't go well. Amen. Oh, so people can complain to you now and say that they're living in hell, but you've got to tell them what you're living now is not compared to where you could be going. Because there is a fate worse than death. He also wanted to ensure that there is no way you can ever live again. But I have come, Jesus says. Amen. I have come. Amen. Huh? I didn't leave you in your condition. I came. Yes. So that you not just have life, oh, but understand that this life is greater than you can possibly imagine. That word abundance. I thank God for uh, my mom, Tori, at this time. Uh, one of the reasons why I thank God for her is that she has really encouraged me over the last year to appreciate that it's not just about abiding in Christ, but once we abide, we must abound. Hallelujah. Because Hallelujah. only as you abound, then you'll discover the abundance. Hallelujah. 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 Again, this is why I'm so grateful for this particular gathering of believers. Uh, because I understand that Pastor Daniel, as I understand it, Pastor Daniel, he doesn't need you to be here. Mm -hmm. He's not desperate. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to hold on to mm -hmm. you and say, please come, please come. Mm -hmm. Please come and please stay. Please come and please stay and please pray. Please come and please. He's, he's, not, he's not desperate because he's more concerned that you would discover who you are in Christ. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who you are in Christ is far greater than just coming every week 
and just do what he's asked to do because you are called for an abundance. Hallelujah. Because he's come to give you life that is abundant. So that however small you thought life was, Jesus is here to turn the key so that you can realize there's more to life than what you see. Hallelujah. 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 There's more to life. I don't want you to just live. I don't just want you to exist. I want you to enjoy the abundance. I want you to appreciate abundance is not reflected in your bank balance. I want you to appreciate that abundance is not reflected in your property portfolio. I want you to see that abundance is seen when you have the capacity to come alongside somebody and tell them about Jesus and that person's darkness can be turned to light. Hallelujah. 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 John has an agenda. His agenda isn't just that you read and you yeah, tick, tick, tick. Going he wants you to see that it with every sign that this says that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Believe that. And then don't just believe that, but go and believe in his name to experience the abundance of life. Because you live in a world that does not accept the abundance of life. They have a small mentality. Even empires, they will look to rule and to conquer, and they will never have enough because they have a small mentality. Hmm? And we are born and conditioned to have a small mentality. Uh, you should just be satisfied with what you've got. You should just be content that you've got all that you have and just live, with, live within yourself. Stay right there. Don't change, don't move, because this is all you have. This is all you're ever going to have. That's what your world is telling you. Don't step out of place. But this is why Jesus comes to look at that agenda and say to that agenda, no. He doesn't say, oh, that's a nice one. Oh, I like that one. It just needs a bit of printing up. He looks at that agenda and says, no. When I think about creation and how God created the heavens and the earth, and when I think about that psalm that Zoe read about the splendor and the glory of the earth, and then how God has placed us just a little lower than angels and given us dominion over this vast world, you cannot have a small mentality. And so Jesus has come to wreck our mentality. He doesn't want to improve your life. He wants to transform your life. Hallelujah. He wants Hallelujah. you to understand that your heart isn't good enough. You need a new heart. He wants you to understand that your mind is not good enough. You need to have a new mind. And once you have that new mind, I'll continue to renew it. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's go to my episode. I might only really have time for one episode, but if God is gracious, we might need it too. But I don't have time. We'll see how it goes. I'm not a big fan, actually, from referring to time. We'll see how God goes. And that's how we do it. So let's go over to John chapter 5. So we understand John's agenda in writing what he's written. Every sign is supposed to tell you that he is the Christ, and that he is the Son of God, and that when you believe in his name, you who were dead can have life. It's good news. Let's see this in action in terms of an interesting agenda in John chapter 5. As you go over to John chapter 5, uh, allow me to remind those of you, or to inform those of you, uh, when we look at the book of John, uh, what I find fascinating is that John has two important sevens. And why I find it interesting that there are sevens in John is because of the seventh day. And you'll notice that what is Jesus criticised for most? most? He's criticised for most what he's doing on the seventh day. Huh? He's criticized. And John doesn't just want you to know that he is Lord. He wants you to know that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Hallelujah. He is Lord of the seventh day. He is Lord of the rest. But Jesus understands that you can never have rest until you're whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's no point in coming up to a particular time of saying rest when you're still broken. Mm. What rest are you having? There's no point in saying that you're at rest when you're still in misery and still in pain. There's no point. 
So Jesus has come and said, if there's any day that I want you to prove to you how much I care for you, on this day when they told me not to work, this is exactly the day that I will do the work that is necessary so that you can rest. Yeah. I will work so you can rest. Amen. I will work so you can rest. Amen. Uh, if that's good news, you can even remind yourself, you know what, Jesus, you paid the price so that I could rest in you. Hallelujah. There is no other price I have to pay. There's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. no, I, didn't have, I know it's hard to believe, but I didn't have enough money uh, to pay for my sins. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough. I didn't, I didn't have enough in that bank account mm -hmm. or the other bank account or the one that my wife doesn't know about. I don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough money to pay for the debt that I owe. I don't have enough. But Jesus came and paid for it. Amen. And not only did he pay for it, but he's now liberated you to go alongside other people and say, did you know that he has done the work so that you can rest? Amen. 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 Did you know that? Did you know that he has paid so that you don't have to? And did you know that he has paid because you can't? And then when you have recognized what he's paid, uh, you should, oh, there, there's such a big sigh of relief. You can imagine if you have been in great debt. I am still coming to this point. You can understand that if you've been in great debt and you owed so much money and it was a weight on your head, you woke up every morning and your name wasn't Christopher Dryden, your name was Christopher, do you know how much I owe? Dryden. <laughs> <laughs> and you would wake up every day with that weight on your head. People would look at you and say, good morning. And you would only agree with them about one of those words. It really is morning. It's not good. I've got a weight on my head. And can you imagine somebody says, you know that debt that you had, I will pay it for you. Can you imagine the relief? Hallelujah. All of a sudden you can say, good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's just Christopher Dryden. In fact, it's Christopher. I don't owe him. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus wants you to know that what he has done for you is even greater than that person who would pay that financial debt. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that if you really understood what Jesus has done for you, you should be able to say good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because it is a good morning because my sins have been wiped away. Uh, I am forgiven. I am redeemed. Amen. I have been bought with a price. Yeah. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a good morning. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Is it alright if I'm a bit um, autobiographical? Yeah. In terms of if I share a bit. Is that alright if I share a bit about my life? Not all of it. I'm learning that at the time, all of it. But just a bit about my life. <laughs> so, John chapter 5. <laughs> <laughs> After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five rude colonnades, and in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. At one man was there, who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him being there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, um, do you want to be healed? Uh, the sick man answered him, oh, sir, I don't want to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up and while I'm going, another person sits there before me. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I'll oh, get up, take up your bed and walk. <laughs> and at once, the man was healed, and he took up his bed and he walked. Now, that day was the Sabbath. <laughs> so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, hey, hey, hold on a minute, it is the Sabbath. <laughs> it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Oh, but he asked, oh, it's not lawful, governor. The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. 
They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? <laughs> now the man who had been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Now, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Oh, the man went away, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Oh, but Jesus answered them, uh, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Ah, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. It's such a fascinating episode in scripture. Such a fascinating episode. I could literally spend hours going at different elements and aspects of the scripture, but I'm aware I don't have hours. I just want to give you this particular insight in terms of we can look at the Jews who are accusing Jesus. We can look at them, we can. And we certainly should look at Jesus. We certainly should look at Jesus. And remember, Jesus fulfills the agenda. Because we remember that the agenda wasn't just that you believe in his name, but in believing you will have life. And that's exactly what Jesus says here. Listen, my father's working. I'm working. All I'm doing is what I see my father doing. And I'm about to have it of seeing the dead and just bringing them back up to life. I might as well do the same. Which is interesting. If that's Jesus' agenda, what does that say about our agenda as his body? If Jesus is in the business of looking for the dead and bringing them to life, looking at dead situations and speaking over it, and bring, if that's Jesus who we serve, if that's Jesus who we're a part of his body, what does that say about us? What should be our agenda? Question I won't answer. Question I will leave it to you to answer in the coming days and weeks. Because you will have opportunities of dead situations and Jesus will ask you, will it be your will or will it be mine? So you can look at the Jews and you look at Jesus. I want us to look at the man. I want us to look at the man. And this is where it gets personal. So I won't be too long. So here is the man. And he has been in the condition for how long? 28 years. Would you agree with the scripture that that is a long time? That's a long time. And we can understand your frustration in year one. We can understand that. And we can understand your, your frustration in year five. But this has been 38 years. And it's such a shock that when somebody comes up to you and says, you know that you've been in that condition, would you like that condition to change? That your answer is a yes. Hmm. Would you agree with me that if you're in a condition for 38 years and said, would you like your condition to change? Wouldn't your answer be yes? Yes, yes please. Can you help me? Where were you 37 years ago? You know, that would be my answer. But this man comes up to Jesus and says, you don't understand the second. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you don't understand. You don't understand. Man. I mean, every time I try to get in there, man, somebody gets in the way of me. It's so difficult. 
You can't be all the fault in here. I mean, is it my fault? Oh, poor me. I've been in this situation for years. But I want you to notice, not only is this man a physical cripple, he's also crippled inside. Amen. Because if you've been in a condition for that long, that's all you know, that's all that you're used to, that's all that you will accept. And that is a picture of the world that we live in. Because the world that we live in is not designed to liberate you, it's designed to cripple you. That's right. There are systems in place that are deliberately designed to ensure you do not live. Mm -hmm. And your design of life should only be to please other people. Mm -hmm. And to serve other people. And to feed other people. So that while they're getting bigger and fatter and richer, you are getting smaller and weaker and poorer. And so we think that that's, we think, oh, it's unfair. Oh, we know it's bad. Oh, it's not right. We'll say that, and then we'll stay in that condition for a long time. Because that's been our agenda. This is why I give God thanks for Jesus. Because Jesus just comes in and bursts in, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't come to the poor man and say, oh, poor you. Yeah. Would, you, would, you, would, you, would you like a cup of tea with two sugars and milk? <laughs> I feel for your pain. I feel your sorrow. No, Jesus says, get him. Take him out and walk. You're taking up space. Your time of illness is over. You better go and get over here. So Jesus heals him physically. And he walks. But he only walks into trouble. And what's his first response in trouble? His first response in trouble is the very same response he gave when he was in the first trouble which is to make excuses that it's not my fault. <laughs> Do you want to be healed? It's not my fault. <laughs> Who told you to get up and walk? It's not my fault. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you'll notice, in this entitled culture that we live in, we know what we deserve, but we also know how quickly when things happen, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's the world. It's the system. Yeah. It's the government. Yeah. It's the school. Yes. It's the churches, exactly. it's my mom, yes. it's my dad, yes. it's everyone. Yes. <laughs> indeed, you're, you're, indeed, if I can become somewhat musical, they will blame it on the sunshine. They will blame it on the good time. They will blame it on the boogie. They will blame it on anything. <laughs> oh, because they've been cultured and conditioned to blame. And then where did we get that from? We got that all the way from the beginning, where Adam was given a responsibility with a clear instruction. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And then God comes in the garden and says, Adam, where are you? God isn't blind. God isn't blind. That first question in scripture is not for God's benefit. It's for Adam's. Because when I'm in the garden, I expect you in my presence. Yes. It's an expectation. It's the norm. And that's why we have to challenge ourselves again, back to that question again. If Jesus is agenda to give life, what is the church's agenda? And could the challenge for the church be, are there issues that we're hiding from Jesus? And that we're saying, it's not my fault. It's not my fault where we're not making more disciples. It's not my fault. It's not my fault why more people aren't coming to know Jesus. It's not my fault. It's the world. It's the system. It's the devil. It's this and this and the other. And Jesus has no room for your excuses. Amen. And I am not, I, I hope you understand, I'm not just talking to you. And this is where the brief story comes in, very quickly. My wife knows what it is to live with a man who makes excuses for still being emotionally crippled. Because you can be in church, and you can say the right things, and you can still need healing inside. Because you're a cripple. You cannot walk. You cannot move. You cannot function. And whose fault is it? You're blaming everyone. If only my dad had raised me up the right way. If only my mom had given me a bit more attention. If only they gave me that position. My wife knows what it is to live with somebody in that condition. To be well. And that's why Jesus goes back to that man and says, listen, you're physically well. Good. But hold on a minute. Don't sin anymore. 
anymore. Just in case something worse happens to you. It's not amazing for Jesus to say that to someone. Oh, this wonderful Jesus who would say to a woman, Oh, well, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Huh? Where is this at? But he goes to this man. He, the Bible says he finds the man in the temple. As though Jesus was looking for him to say, Hey, it's good to see you physically well. Good. But now make sure that your relationship with God is right. Make sure. Make sure your relationship with God is right. Because it's now your response to what God has done that will make the difference. Mm. Because an encounter with Jesus will expose your agendas. Mm. An encounter with Jesus will expose you for who you really are. Mm. But thank God for the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Mm. Who doesn't just want you to get up and walk. He wants you to follow him. Hallelujah. He wants you to follow him on where he's going and what he's doing and how he is about the agenda of, I don't just want you to believe in who I am, I want you to have life in my name. I have discovered then, walking with Jesus, that the more I walk with Jesus is the more that he heals me. He heals me inside. He heals me of my emotional wounds. He heals me of my mental torment. He heals me of the way that I used to think about myself because he reminds me, I am no longer my own. I belong to him. It is not about my agenda. It is not my will. It's only his that should be done. A will that wants to see people who likewise knows what it is to be emotional cripples find life and strength and joy and a reason to say that their name is no longer Christopher, I owe so much money for that. But they will recognize that their name is Christopher, Christ Carrier. Mm. 